Hey, it's the third week of Advent. Guess what the topic is? <laughs> All right, very good. You have a third week, and I have to tell you, the Bible says so much about joy. In fact, there are more than 500 references in the Bible that include the word joy, <clears throat> and about another 300 or more uh, that include the word rejoice. And when we think of the first advent of Christ, advent meaning arrival, coming, the first coming of Christ, we can't help but recall the words of the angel to the shepherds in the fields surrounding Bethlehem. And I want us to look at these verses as we begin this morning. Luke chapter 2, starting in verse 8. It says, And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. And they were terrified. They were terrified. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy. Great joy. That will be for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. Father God, we thank you, Lord, for, for, the, for this reason that we, we can have such joy. Because the light of the world came in. To our world. That Jesus Christ arrived. Born as an infant. In the town of David. In Bethlehem. And we thank you God for this good news. Of great joy. That can be for anyone. For all the people. And Lord I pray God that. that by the time we leave here this morning. That we will have a greater understanding. Of what joy really is. And how to have it. And we give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And you know, that, that reference in Luke, that is the first reference that we have in the New Testament concerning the topic of joy. And what I want us to do this morning is take a very simple, I want us to do a very direct approach in our study of this topic. Because if you're like me, then you only really care about two things concerning joy. And the first is having an understanding Maybe a definition of what joy is. I mean, knowing what it is. That's the first thing. We have to know what joy is. Let's try to define it. And then secondly, we need to figure out how to get it. You know, where does it come from? I think we all want it. And so let's just quickly look at the definition. And, 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 and here's what Merriam-Webster Online Dictionary says. It offers us this explanation. Joy is the emotion evoked by well-being, success, or good fortune. Or by the prospect of possessing what one desires. That's the definition of joy. Or it can be the expression or exhibition of such emotion. And thirdly, it says that it is a state of happiness or felicity. And so I'm okay with that rather common definition of joy. But ever since first coming to Christ and becoming a believer, I've always understood joy to be something deeper and more meaningful, more resilient than just the concept of being happy, right? Amen. It's something different. I've always heard that joy is more than just an emotion. And twice in that online definition, it was, it was classified as an emotion. I believe it's more than an emotion. And the basis for this biblical definition of joy that I have found in my life is found in verses, as strange as they may seem, verses like James chapter 1 and verse 2, which says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers. Consider it pure joy. I just find it interesting that, that it's got this word before, before this issue of joy. Pure joy. Consider it pure joy. Pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials. I mean, think about it. When was the last time you were really over, just overly thrilled about going through a hard time? It doesn't make sense. But he says, consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Now, I do like the end result that's given to us there. I mean, wouldn't it be great to not lack anything? Wouldn't it be great to have everything? Wouldn't it be great to, be, to feel like you're just so complete that you've made it? I mean, that's, that's a great feeling. And that's what's being told us here, that if we will allow these trials and tribulations to work in our life, if we'll welcome them and accept them with, a, with some degree of joy, that in the end, we will be a better person. Here in this earth will be a better person. Look at, look at what he said. Count it all joy. Consider it all joy when problems come into your life. 
I mean, that in itself, that sounds, that sounds like something much more hefty than happiness. It's hard to be happy when tough times come knocking at your door. I mean, we can muster up a smile. Some of us can slip into denial and we can try to hide what we're going through. That's not, that's not happiness. And joy is also not pretending to be happy. You know, I, I, saw, I saw a lot of people slip into this. When I became a new, you know, a new believer and first came to Christ, I saw a lot of people go there where you know, they, they came to church and they put on this big smile. Their life is falling apart, but they're, oh yeah, praise God, everything's wonderful. And I saw through that, even as a new Christian. I wasn't going to do that. I just wasn't going to do that. They would hide the pain. They would try to hide the disappointment with a mask of happiness. And some people will try inside. They're dying on the outside, though. They're trying to keep up a good front. And I'm going to tell you, church should be the last place you have to do that. You know, really. I mean, you don't have to come. If I do do ask you, how are you, you know, I mean... Don't get real negative. It's okay to be real. But don't get real negative. I mean, I'll try to pick you up. I think we got some extra spatulas in the kitchen. I'll just try to scrape you up off the floor and blow some air into you and get you back to life. I mean, whatever I can do. But no, you know what I'm saying? But be real. Be real. If something's really happened, let us know. You know, one of my biggest gripes as a pastor is someone will, they'll, be, they'll go into the hospital. And today, they don't keep you in the hospital unless you really need to be in the hospital, right? I mean, you can be near death. You get one night and then you're kicked out. That's how they do it today. And, and that's okay. It's not just insurance purposes. It's healthier to be out of the hospital from what I understand. But, but at any rate, you know, I feel so bad when someone's in for a couple days and we never, we never find out in the, in the church office. I feel so bad. And I tell, I tell people who come through the new members class, if you know you're going in for a procedure and you'd want us to, to pray for you, if you'd want us to maybe, you know, maybe a quick visit or something, let us know. Because one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit is not ESP. Okay? That's actually the occult. We don't know. We're not a mind reader. And if you don't, and if you're going through something in your life and you feel like, and I know Christians that do this, they're going through something in their life and they feel like they're bearing that burden all by themselves. I'm telling you, it shouldn't be that way. Galatians says that we're to share our burdens with each other. And not just the pastoral staff, but we're to share our burdens with each other. So don't worry about hiding them. Don't, you don't have to live in denial and prove that you're some super strong Christian. Now, James, again, is saying, though, when those instances come to you, you know, you can, you can still have joy. Amen? You may not be happy. You may not be happy, but you can still have joy. And it was kind of funny, as I was putting this message together, I remembered an old song by Smokey Robinson and the Miracles. (laughs) Yeah, he laughs, you know. (laughs) He's never heard the song. Ryan, I don't know if you know who Smokey Robinson is, but your dad has to play it for you later. But it was so funny. I was thinking about this song, and at the same time, my wife, um, she found something new. She found a new app on her iPhone. Uh, I Heart Music? I don't listen to any of that. But she was, she was doing Pandora. And, and I hear her, and she's not, she's not one that, like, if we're in the car, she doesn't want music. She doesn't, I've never known her really to like music. She's walking around in the house with her iPhone on, blaring music. This has never happened. 40 years of marriage. I've never known her to play music ever. If I put it on the, she, she's blaring music. And as it's, she's, I mean, she's walking around the house with her hand, phone in her hand. And I can hear Smokey Robinson singing the song that I was thinking about. And I'm not going to sing it for you. <laughs> Pastor Brandon, I bet you know it. I bet you could do it for us. But, but anyways, Smokey Robinson Miracles, it's, it's, it's on my, I do have it. I bought it a long time ago. It's on my iPhone. She's listening to it through iHeartMusic. The Tears of a Clown came out in 1967. And again, I wouldn't dare sing it for you, but I'm going to read you the lyrics. Um, the song goes like this. Now, if I appear to be carefree, it's only to camouflage my sadness. And honey, to shield my pride, I try to cover this hurt with a show of gladness. See what I'm saying? Denial and and pretending. But don't let my show convince you that I've been happy since you decided to go. Oh, I need you so. It sounds so dumb reading this in church. But it gets the point across. I'm hurt and I want you to know, but for others I put on a show. Isn't that appropriate? Isn't that appropriate? Some people, I'm pretty sure Smokey's a believer, but... So obviously, we can work at appearing happy. Amen? Come on. We can do that. But joy is different. 
The Apostle Peter in his first letter, he mentions the same issue as James did. In 1 Peter 4.12, he says, Dear friends, do not be surprised at the painful trial that you are suffering as though something strange were happening to you. But look at this. Look at verse 13. But rejoice, rejoice that you participate in the sufferings of Christ so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. Look at that. It's the same exact theme of what we heard from James. Rejoice in the suffering and know that someday you will be overjoyed when God's glory is revealed. Rejoice. Take joy. Have joy. And the Apostle Paul too, in his epistles, both those that he wrote to churches, those that he wrote to Timothy and individuals, a number of times he expresses to them the ability to rejoice in hardship and suffering and he did so in most of the letters that he wrote to those churches and to Timothy. And I want us to read a sample of this together. I mean, one of the, I think one of the most extreme situations. And it's the 16th chapter of Acts. And this is a terrific example of how Paul could rejoice in the worst of circumstances. Re having joy, rejoicing in the worst of circumstances. Acts 16, verse 16. It says, once when we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit by which she predicted the future, a demonic spirit. She earned a great deal of money for her owners by fortune telling. This girl followed Paul and the rest of us. And she would shout, these men are servants of the most high God who are telling you the way to be saved. Talk about advertising. And she kept this up for many days. And finally Paul became so troubled that he turned around and he said to the spirit in her, in the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. And at that moment, the spirit left her. When the owners of the slave girl realized that their hope of making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to face the authorities. They brought them before the magistrates and said, these men are Jews and they're throwing our city into an uproar by advocating customs that are unlawful for us Romans to accept or practice. The crowd joined in the attack against Paul and Silas and the magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten. And after they'd been severely, severely flogged, they were thrown into prison, and the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. Upon receiving such orders, he put them in the inner cell and fastened their feet in the stocks. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once all the prison doors flew open and everybody's chains came loose. Now what I love about this is every, I love the level of detail here. Every intricate detail is given. Again, they're, they're, you know, Paul being annoyed at this woman with this demonic spirit. I mean, to the point where he does, you know, I mean, it is, it's good advertising. But he wants it to stop because he wants her free. He sets her free and they get beaten for it. And not only are they beaten, but they're stripped of their clothing, any, any ounce of protection, and they're beaten severely. So severely flogged, thrown in jail. The jailer himself puts them into the innermost cell and he puts their feet in stocks. You understand? They're not able to walk around. They're, they're in one position. And then we read again, when you talk about detail... It's about midnight. I don't know when things settled down. I don't know when the beating ended. But notice we're told that about midnight, they began to sing. They began to sing hymns. They began to praise God. And the other prisoners are listening. I mean, what a testimony. And for me, that's an obvious proof that joy of the joy that they had within themselves. I don't know that any one of us have experienced anything even close to that. And yet they had such joy that they would praise God. And I'll be honest with you, I think most of us, I hope you're with me, most of us would be, God, what's wrong with you? Why are you letting this happen to me, right? Or don't we, we go right into that mode. How could this happen to me? This is so unfair. Lord, we've been doing your work and this is the result of it. That's not, we don't see, we don't see that anywhere in that 16th chapter of Acts. There's no complaining to God. They begin singing, they begin worshiping God. And you know what? It's with examples like that that we can do a side-by-side -side comparison between joy and happiness. And we have, to, we have to conclude that joy is something that is not circumstantial. Joy is not contingent upon the surrounding environment. In other words, it's clearly possible to be joyful even when there appears to be no tangible reason for that joyfulness. Amen?
And so I want us to directly contrast these two. And let's consider the difference between being happy and having joy. And here's how I like to define the two. Being happy, in my mind, is always the result of something good and positive happening in my life. I get happy. I do. When something, I mean, it's like, wow, that's unbelievable. I can't believe. Yo, know, thank you, Lord. Being happy has always been rooted in receiving whatever might be pleasing or satisfying to me. And the same is true of you. If pleasure came my way, then I was happy. Tough times arrived at my door, then I'm going to be miserable. You, re you respond to it. You react to it. And what I've learned is that joy doesn't operate that way. Not at all. According to God's word and my personal experience as a Christian, I have the capacity to have joy even when I'm going through a trial. Even when I'm, I'm subjected to some kind of tribulation, some kind of hardship, and I don't really know how to explain it, but joy seems to be something deeper and more durable than happiness. It's richer. It's not as fleeting as happiness. And I have to wonder if this is because of where joy comes from. You know, we define joy, but where does it come from? And, and, and that's the second portion of a, a, a question about joy this morning. What is the source of joy? And we've always learned the source of happiness is circumstance. We understand that. But where does joy come from? And once you see the answer to this question, then you'll understand why joy is so much more enduring. You see, obviously joy comes from God. It really does. You can't muster it up. Again, we can cover up stuff that's going on in life. We can cover up. But joy comes from God. We don't create it. In fact, just like peace, which we studied last week, it's listed as one of the fruit of the Spirit. And the word of can mean from. The, the, the preposition in there can mean from. It's fruit from the Holy Spirit. Let's look at Galatians, the fifth chapter, verse 22. It says, but the fruit of or from the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things, there is no law. So clearly, from what we just read here, joy is the fruit that comes from the Holy Spirit. And the word that's used here, the word that's translated as fruit here, can also be tr translated as result. In other words, we could say the result of the Holy Spirit. It also can be translated as gain, something that you gain. Makes you wealthier. Okay? So these things that are listed here are clearly the product, love, joy, peace, are clearly the product of the Holy Spirit. And although they're to be displayed in our lives, they don't ever belong to us in the sense that we don't, we don't initiate them. They belong to Him. He's the author. He's the creator. He's the catalyst that produces these things in us. And Galatians 5.22 could easily read this way. The results of of the Holy Spirit in our lives, our love, joy, peace, etc. And it makes sense. When you, when you think about the verses that immediately precede this one, I want us to go back, look at verse 19 through 21. Let's look at these for a moment. It says, the acts of the sinful nature are obvious. Okay? Now, we just read, we went ahead and read the results of the Holy Spirit. But the acts of the sinful nature are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. Paul says, I, I warn you as I did before that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. You see, these are the things, these are the things, a sampling of things that we can produce naturally. Those things come out of us naturally. Those are the results of functioning that's the fruit of functioning in our natural capacity. And you know that because we have to fight against that much of the time. There's quite a, there's quite a contrast here between the things of the flesh and the things of the spirit. And I might also mention to you that the context of this passage in Galatians does delineate all of this for us in the way of a responsibility. In other words, although we can't not manufacture joy, because it's a product of and a product from the Holy Spirit. We do yet have to do something to have joy in our life. Okay? Again, the, the acts of the sinful nature, they just come out of us if we're not careful. But the fruit of the Spirit actually requires something of us. And I want you to look at this, and it's found in verse 16 of that same chapter. Paul says, So I say, 
Live by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of sinful nature. See the responsibility? Two, if you're going to produce all that vile, all that vile fruit or results of the carnal nature, that just comes naturally. But here he says, live by the Spirit and you won't gratify those desires. For the sinful nature desires what is contrary to the Holy Spirit and the Spirit what is contrary to the sinful nature. They are in conflict with each other so that you do not do what you want. But if you're led by the Spirit, you're not under law. And so verse 16, live or walk by the Spirit. Live or walk by the Spirit. That connotes choice. That points to a decision that has to be made in our own hearts, on our part. When we do this, when we choose to walk in the Spirit, when we choose to live in the Spirit, we then become recipients of the fruit that comes from the Holy Spirit. That's how it works. So if you want the fruit of the Spirit in your life, then you've got to be living in the Spirit. You've got to be walking in the Holy Spirit. Now, what does it mean to live or walk in the Spirit? I think probably the best picture I can give you is what Jesus shared and it's recorded in John's Gospel, the 15th chapter. And I, I, possibly the best illustration of what it means to be connected, to walk, to live, to be connected to the Holy Spirit and being able to bear fruit. Because it's, it, it does have some overlap here. Right at verse 1, Jesus is speaking and he says, I am the true vine and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. See, it's talking about fruitfulness again. While every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it'll be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me. That's walking in the spirit, living in the spirit. Remain in me and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine You are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not remain in me, he's like a branch that's thrown away and withers. And such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it'll be given to you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourself to be my disciples, my followers, my students. Verse 9, as the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love. If you obey my commands, you'll remain in my love, just as I've obeyed my Father's commands and remain in his love. I've told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love is no one than this, that he laid down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I've called you friends for everything that I learned from my father I've made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you. I appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. And then the father will give you whatever you ask in my name. This is my command. Love each other. Now, verse 11, verse 11. He said, I have told you this, all this, so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. Isn't that incredible? The purpose of this entire discourse that Jesus just shared is so that his joy will be in us. Okay, again, we don't manufacture joy. It is a fruit of the Holy Spirit. But he said that his joy would be in us and that this joy that we have would be complete. That's why Jesus says what he says in these verses. He's telling us precisely how to have joy, how to receive joy, how to obtain joy in our lives. And then surrounding verse 11 is the complete explanation of the process. The easiest, simplest way to receive joy is by being connected to its source. Just as branches have to be attached to a vine, to the root of the plant, ultimately, to, in order to survive, we have to be connected to Christ. He's the source of our strength. He's the source of our nourishment. And as much as joy is listed as one of the fruit of the Spirit, and this passage suggests that we are to be fruitful, it clearly tells us what's required for all that to take place. We need to stay connected. Because apart from Jesus, he said what? You can do nothing. You can't do anything. But if we remain in him, then we produce fruit. And I believe that this fruit is both beneficial for ourselves as well as for those around us. Amen. 
And once again, as Jesus told his disciples, and he's speaking to us today, he said, I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. That's powerful. He is the vine. We are the branches. We have to be. We must be connected to him in order to have the fruit of joy in our lives. As we first began this morning, Luke chapter 2. One of the promises that came into this world with the advent of Christ was what? Joy. We bring you good news of joy, great joy. Luke chapter 2, verse 10. I'm going, to, I'm going to read it again. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. 